Hi, and welcoming back to Governing Pandemics 101. I'm Suri Moon, Professor of Practice and Co-Director of the Global Health Center here at the Graduate Institute of International Relations and Development Studies. Today, I'll be presenting a mini lecture on financing a pandemic preparedness and response. My lecture will be organized along three themes. First, I'll talk about what was the global system for financing uh, PPR, as we call it for short, uh, before COVID. Then I'll talk about what happened during the pandemic, and then I'll talk about uh, proposals and ongoing reform processes. So let's look back uh, and, and look at the system for financing prior to COVID. Uh, first, I'd like to just emphasize that the main level where financing happens, where money is mobilized and spent, is at national level, not at the international level. And we think about when we think about what happened at national level, uh, there are three major problems. The first is that there was not enough money invested, and that was because of a couple of reasons. Either governments were unwilling, uh, this was not a high priority for them, or governments were unable. Even if they wanted to invest in PPR, they simply didn't have the space in their budgets. And of course, sometimes it was a combination of both. There's a well-known problem with pandemic preparedness and response, which is that you have what's called the cycle of panic and neglect, which is whenever you have an outbreak or a potential pandemic, tons of money gets mobilized. But when the risk subsides, then the money disappears. And this is certainly something we've seen in many different countries. Uh, the second problem is that we don't have a clear system for actually counting the money. So because pandemic preparedness and response actually has implications across all of government, across multiple sectors, it's very difficult to actually track how much our government's investing. For example, should we count the salaries of nurses working day to day in the health system? Should we count the vaccination of livestock? Uh, should we count um, uh, research and development for vaccines? All of this has uh, implications for pandemic preparedness and response but these kinds of expenses usually sit across multiple budget lines, ministries, and it's not all added together. One of the reasons this is a problem is because it's that it's very difficult to actually track, are we spending enough? Is spending increasing or decreasing over time? And how do you hold uh, various governments accountable for actually spending what they're supposed to um, uh, invest in, in PPR. Finally, the third challenge is that very little uh, development assistance has been allocated for PPR. So as I mentioned, some countries simply don't have enough resources uh, to uh, strengthen their national health systems to be prepared for potential pandemics. And this is where development assistance plays a role. But as you look at this slide, you can see that development assistance for health has peaked at about 40 billion per year over the last few years. It's really flat. Line. I'll come back to that in just a few moments. Uh, but it's also really allocated across just uh, a number of diseases. It tends to be quite siloed, uh, and the money does not necessarily go towards the strengthening of health systems overall, nor for emergency preparedness. So for all of these reasons, at national level, you had a very uh, insufficient system for uh, financing PPR. A number of these uh, problems were addressed uh, and a number of reforms were put in place prior to COVID-19, many of them in response to the West African Ebola crisis in uh, 2014. So for example, it became clear after the Ebola crisis that WHO financing did not allow it to react quickly and to mount a rapid emergency response. And because of that, there has been created a new fund called the Contingency um, Fund for Emergencies, which has helped WHO to be more responsive. That fund has not met its full potential, but it is an important uh, improvement that was made. Uh, you also had a number of countries uh, beginning to do more stringent self-assessments uh, to also open themselves up to peer assessment uh, as to whether their health systems were strong enough for uh, potential pandemics, and they would develop what were called national costed action plans. The problem is that even where countries did develop a price tag for what it would cost as you bring their systems up to the necessary levels, money did not necessarily follow, that you had a price tag but nobody to actually pay those bills. Another problem uh, was that many countries may not have the incentive to share information quickly about an outbreak if they don't expect that international assistance, financial or operational, will mobilize quickly in response. And so the World Bank created uh, an initiative called the Pandemic Emergency Financing Facility, or PEF for short, that was in, an effort to actually address this problem. They said, we'll make money available quickly in the event of a country sharing information about a potential outbreak. Uh, and they worked with insurance companies in order to develop a rather complex mechanism uh, where uh, what were called pandemic bonds would be sold to investors. Uh, this program was ultimately not successful. The deployments of money were uh, too small and too slow, and ultimately uh, this fund was closed down in April of 2021.
Finally, in terms of understanding what is the total amount of money needed at the international level to finance PPR, there was progress on this made, again, in the wake of the Ebola crisis. A study estimated that we needed about 4.5 billion U.S. dollars per year at the international level for our three priorities, mainly financing WHO, providing support to low- and middle-income countries that would need it, and um, a research and development of countermeasures such as vaccines. However, while that recommendation was made, there was very little done to actually raise money uh, for that recommendation. And so what you can see overall is that there was a growing awareness of the problems with financing, but very little concrete action, and what there was was relatively small in scale. Now let's fast forward into what happened during the uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID crisis. So here's an economic crisis that hit essentially all countries of the world almost all at once. And what happened was, of course, not only major increases in spending on health, for example, to pay health worker salaries, to purchase uh, uh, vaccines and oxygen and um, uh, personal protective equipment, but there were also many, many other implications throughout the economy. Major increases in unemployment, major drops in economic productivity, in financial markets, in trade. Uh, you had a need to really increase spending on social safety nets, um, such as unemployment benefits, food security, support to vulnerable groups. And this has meant that many governments have been going um, into debt. Many governments have, have engaged in deficit spending. We are still seeing what the long-term economic impacts of the pandemic will be, but it's estimated uh, that we've had at least around $5 trillion of economic losses. And in the high-income countries that put a lot of money into economic stimulus, they spent between 20 and 50 percent of GDP in doing so. We've also had, of course, uh, an estimated 120 million additional people pushed below the poverty line, and uh, many people whose long-term earnings will be harmed because of their uh, inability to, to go to school during the pandemic. So the economic costs, the long-term financial costs of this pandemic are, are tremendous. Uh, so what have been some of the responses during the pandemic? Uh, one of the main sources, of course, as I mentioned, was at the national level for those countries that could go into debt um, or deficit spend. This is what happened. For those countries that rely on international financing, the World Bank was a very important source. They mobilized an incredible $200 billion over the last couple of years, about two-thirds of that in support through the concessional arm for the poorest countries, through what's called the IBRD and the IDA, about one-third of that targeting private sector and countries countries that are a higher level of um, higher level of development. We also had, uh, in, when we focus in on the health sector and we focus in on health commodities, the creation of the ACT Accelerator, which we've covered in previous lectures, which stands for the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. And this was a group of global health agencies that tried to mobilize money quickly. They've raised uh, almost $20 billion, about $19 billion uh, as of today, to purchase vaccines, drugs, diagnostics, oxygen, to uh, invest in strengthening health systems. And this was an incredible amount of money mobilized in a short period of time. If you remember, I just said that in an average year, uh, official development or development assistance, I should say, for health was about 40 billion. So an additional 50% on top of that was mobilized quickly. However, it was still too little and it was still too slow. Uh, and so while money was, um, the amount of money was unprecedented, this is not sufficient to actually purchase enough vaccines, drugs, or diagnostics for the countries that could not purchase them on their own. Uh, and the money was mobilized too late because, of course, the accelerator had not been created until after COVID began. So many people recognized that it would be better to create such funds prior to an emergency rather than waiting for an emergency in order to do that. So let's now turn, indeed, to what are some of the reform proposals that have been made and what has been decided to date. So as mentioned in one of the earlier lectures, there were a whole uh, group of international reviews that were conducted over the last couple of years, and they made a, a number of recommendations regarding finance. Many of them focused on WHO. So as I mentioned before, there was a small change that was made to finance its emergency operations, but almost no change made to actually finance the organization as a whole in a more sustainable and reliable way. There has been very important progress in May of 2022 at the most recent World Health Assembly, member states finally decided to increase uh, the uh, proportion of the core budget that would be financed through mandatory contributions, make, bring that from the current level of about 17% to bring that up to 50%. Uh, by the year 2030-31. Uh, so gradually, we should see improvement in WHO financing over the next uh, decade. 
There were also recommendations in these reviews to invest money in the international financing of research and development of countermeasures, and it remains to be seen what exactly that will look like. And last but not least, recommendations to, uh, to create a new international fund of some kind. And I should mention that the international review that focused most tightly on financing was uh, brought together by the G20, the group of 20, and they created a high-level independent panel that came up with a number of specific uh, figures for what would be needed. And their estimate was it would actually require about $15 billion per year over the next five years in order to really have a step change uh, in uh, international preparedness, and that's at the international level, and that on top of that, low- and middle-income countries would need to increase their public spending on health by 1% of GDP, which is a huge, huge uh, increase in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, what I'd like to say about this recommendation regarding low- and middle-income countries is that this is not only a, a significant increase in spending, but a recommendation was also made that there is more uh, accountability for countries increasing and reaching a, a bare level, uh, a bare minimum level of health spending, and this would be across the board for entire health systems, and that additional incentives would be provided by the international financial institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund or, or the World Bank, to try to get governments indeed to increase their domestic national spending on health. And this is probably where the largest amount of money um, could be mobilized if indeed this is what uh, countries do. Um. The uh, G20 uh, panel also recommended that much of the international spending goes towards global public goods. So not only thinking about this as an investment and development aid, but also as a way of mobilizing money for what are called global public goods, which would benefit everybody, but which would also require that many, many different countries are willing to put money into the pot. This is a very significant change from the way most governments spend on health at the international level. Mostly that has come as a result of official development assistance. So this will require structural change um, at the national level in many countries that have traditionally been seen as donors. Last but not least, the uh, G20 group uh, suggested that a Global Health Threats Board be created with finance ministers and health ministers brought together so that they could address the political problem that attention wanes in between um, pandemics or in between health emergencies. And the idea is that it's not only health, but also finance ministers who need to sustain investments and sustain the political will for investments over time. I'd just like to flag $15 billion may sound like a lot of money, especially when we compare it to existing spending. But when we think about total health spending world wide, it's about uh, $7 trillion per year. So this is a very, very small amount of total health spending worldwide and a very small amount compared to the, the amount of economic losses that we've seen as a result of COVID. Okay, as of today, June 2022, there actually has been concrete movement. Uh, and by the end of the month, we expect that both the G20 uh, and the World Bank will agree to the creation of a new fund, currently called the Financial Intermediary Fund, uh, that would sit at the World Bank, but be governed um, by, by a, a, a dedicated um, governance mechanism. And this fund so far has attracted uh, commitments of almost $1 uh, billion, but remember the target is 10 or $15 billion per year, uh, and it has raised a number of questions and concerns. So one of the questions is, who is going to contribute to this fund? Which countries and how much? A second question is, of course, how will this fund be governed? Who will be able to make the decisions? And uh, will it be primarily donor countries, those who put the most money in, who will have the most say, or will it be all countries? And will other groups, such as civil society, also be able to play a role in governance? Now, there's a third question. What should the fund actually spend its money on? Would it spend its money only on global public goods? Or would it also spend its money, for example, in national, um, in national health system. Within national health system, would it only focus on, for example, surveillance or laboratories, uh, the kinds of investments that um, uh, may be favored, for example, by outsiders, by high-income countries, uh, but that may not deliver immediate benefits? Or will the fund also, for example, pay for health worker salaries, for road, uh, you know, building health facilities, et cetera, more sort of day-to-day -day health system investments? There's a fourth question, which has to do with whether, again, the money will come from uh, development aid budgets from the richest countries, or will this be coming from an entirely new budget line coming out of ministries of finance for global public goods? Um, 
There's a fifth set of concerns, which is uh, whether the money that might be mobilized for this kind of fund would be coming out of uh, ODA budgets, whether it will cannibalize uh, pre-existing development aid, or whether it will really be new money, uh, or whether money would come out of, for example, the Global Fund, Gavi, Unitaid, bilateral uh, programs, whether other health priorities will be defunded uh, because governments are moving their money into this fund instead. So none of these questions have been clearly answered yet. Uh, but they'll certainly be the issues to watch in the months and the years to come. What I wanted to uh, remind all of us of in closing is that I've spent uh, quite a bit of time in the last few minutes really emphasizing some of the international funds, the international proposals, the international government mechanisms. But as I mentioned before, most money for health is mobilized at national level, and this will continue to be the case. As you can see in this slide, that it's only uh, some countries that rely heavily on international assistance to fund their national health system. So about 33% of health spending in low-income countries comes from international uh, sources. But once you start moving up the income gradient, countries rely much, much less. So for lower middle-income countries, it's only 3%. For upper middle-income countries, it's about 0.3%. And high-income countries, almost not at all. And I flag this because when we think about global governance and pandemic preparedness, there is a tendency to look primarily at these international funds, to look at what have traditionally been donor flows. But the real action, in my view, is really going to be happening uh, at national level. The other area that I haven't covered much uh, is regional. And there is certainly I would say an increased uh, interest, increased political uh, commitment to actually developing new funding mechanisms at the regional level, for example, at the African Union, uh, in the Latin American region, and perhaps uh, and in Europe, perhaps elsewhere, uh, and that not all of the financing changes will be happening uh, at, again, at the international level, but keep a close eye on regional and national as well. And with that, let's turn to our quiz questions.